Uh, you used clickbait, didn't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. I did use some clickbait. You brought up System D in the title, and you didn't even talk about System D. And you don't even have anything against System D. Yep. Yep. I did. Are you actually going to talk about System D this time? Uh, I don't know, man. I guess. Maybe. How's my drinking going for you, by the way? Actually, you know, that's going pretty good. You still feel hungover, though, don't you? Well, you know, when you're over 30 and you don't drink enough water, that's what happens. No, 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 no! Oh, it's new to Dev. Welcome back. Last time we were... I got a new webcam, in case you didn't notice. I'm pretty excited about it. So, <clears throat> anyway. Last time, we're talking about this RC script. And we got to this start daemon section. <clears throat> and I said we'd pick up there when I came back. So, that's what we're going to do. And... <clears throat> These rc.d underscore daemon files are actually pretty short. As an example, this is the smtpd version, and it just says the name of the executable to run the daemon, sources the file, and sets one parameter, which just says that you can't reload, can't ask it to reload its configuration, and then runs whatever command was passed to it. So, <clears throat> in this case, that's the start command. So, <clears throat> what is this rc.subroutines file? Well, <clears throat> I've gone through and made a couple notes, but if you don't want to watch the rest of this video even, you, well, I won't tell you. I'll tell you at the end. I'll tell you a shortcut. So, yeah, I mean, you already know. You already know. So, <clears throat> anyway, let's go through the first couple functions of this. Essentially, there's some functions, check name, make sure that the name of whatever's passed to it is valid. <clears throat> you can do a command, which if you're debugging, it will say that you're doing it and then do it. If you're not debugging, it'll do it and it'll pipe standard output and standard error to dev null. So you won't see error messages or logging or anything like that. We've got this rc error function, echoes the first arg, exits the second arg, or one if it's not given. <clears throat> you can parse the configuration file, that's what a lot of programs want out of this. This will read key value pairs from files that you give it or rc.conf and rc.conf.local if you don't give it anything. And the way it does this is kind of cool, honestly. It essentially reads through each file <clears throat> and... creates a, a key variable that is the key. And it has to be something that it ends in underscore flags, logger, R table, timeout, or user. Or it can be one of these allowed keys up here. These are special extra ones, like PF, package scripts, library, ASLR, et cetera, et cetera. And <clears throat> it finds that. And then it finds the value, which is whatever comes after the equals sign. And then, you know, it removes leading and trailing quotes and blank spaces and comments. And then it does this eval where this first quoting pass by the shell will substitute the value of key right here. And then it will just remove this 
backslash. And then when you evaluate it, it will assign whatever key was to whatever val is. So that's kind of cool, honestly. It just, you know, uses if space and tab for IFS and reads each line. Um, <clears throat> there are some quirks with a couple of these. You don't want to run PF log daemon if you're not running packet filtering. You don't want to run spam logging if you're not running spam, the spam daemon. And you don't want to run NFS with and mount D with bad flag compatibility. And if you just, so in RC, they actually do source this file, but they pass funks, funks only equals one, which means that they stop right here. They just return. They just want to get, really, they just want to get this RC parse conf function. They also want to get this quirks function to make sure that nothing is weird. But really, they just want to get these key value pairs most of the time. So <clears throat> let's continue on, though, since when we run the start daemon, we're going to source the entire file. So <clears throat> this RC not supported is just checking to make sure that you haven't said that a certain action that you can run isn't supported. So if we go back to this SMTPD, you can see right here it says RC underscore reload equals no. Okay, so if you have already sourced the file, when you, <clears throat> and then you set RC reload equals to no, if you then run this RC not supported, it will look in RC actions, which is up here at the very beginning, start, stop, restart, reload, check. And then <clears throat> once it's done, once it's, you know, checked to see if it's restart, then it's going to change what to stop. And then it's going to check and see, <clears throat> okay, if what, you know, the thing that was passed or stop if you passed restart is equal to <clears throat> one of these actions, then it's going to check, it's going to evaluate e not sup is equal to, and then it's this first backslash is going to be escaped. So the first quoting pass will just remove this backslash and then it'll do rc underscore and then what, whatever the action is. So in here, the action is going to be reload. And then it's going to assign that to e not sub when you, when you do the eval pass. <clears throat> and it's going to break. It's going to break out of the loop once it finds whatever you passed it. And then it's just going to check and see if that's equal to no. So right here, it would be equal to no. But in most cases, it won't be. It'll be empty, usually. And then we've got a usage message, which prints all supported actions. So everything in RC actions, if it's not supported, then you don't run the second step. But if it is supported, this will return false. So you'll add it to this all, su all supported section, essentially. And then you're going to just do an error message with usage and then all of the supported actions. So <clears throat> that's all that is. This RC write run file, so whenever you successfully start a daemon, you uh, write a file with all of the things that were used to start it to this render. And we can actually see what that is. It's var rc.d, no, it's var run rc.d. And if you look in here, you can see there's a bunch of daemons. So SMTBD is started by default. If we tap this, you'll see it's got daemon class equals daemon, nothing for daemon flags, nothing for logger, the default routing table, default timeout, user that it started with is root. This is the p ex process expression. It's got a, a 
reload signal, even though it doesn't use it because RC reload is set to no, and it's got a, a, a termination signal. So that's all that, that does. <clears throat> and then you've got the ability to remove it. You've also got this RC exit, which it's going to check if you're in, if you're running this from RC or from RC control. So you will run this script even after the system is booted if you're using RC control to do your daemon shutdown and startup and general maintenance. Or, so if you're in RC or the argument that you pass to this function is okay, then <clears throat> you're going to set prefix to be the first argument that you pass in parentheses. So, just okay, and then, <clears throat> or failed, if you are in, not in RC. <clears throat> and if you're in RC, you're going to do echo without a new line. It's just formatting stuff, really. And <clears throat> this, you know, prefix, you're going to echo whatever you passed, maybe with some parentheses around it. And if the first thing that you passed was okay or killed, meaning you successfully started it or you successfully stopped it, you're going to exit zero, otherwise you exit one. And I'll get in, I'm going to get into this RC alarm, RC wait for start, and all, I'm going to get it, you know, go down this list a little bit farther and do the actual starting and stopping stuff because I'm going to do that in a separate video because it's a little bit more complicated and i got to talk about signals and stuff. So, the other thing, you know, we might as well, might as well talk about system D. So, I have downloaded, I'll do another LS so you can see everything without my ugly mug getting in the way. So, I've downloaded a little bit of... <clears throat> Well, I've downloaded the systemd proper part of systemd. So systemd comes with a bunch of other stuff that is not really initialization or your init file. <clears throat> because when Linux and uh, OpenBSD and most Unix-like operating systems start up, the kernel will search for a file called sbin init. Systemd is the file that uh, sbin init is run on most Linux systems, or is usually symlinked to on most Unix or Linux systems. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we can do, I wonder if I have, yes, so <clears throat> we can do a word count. Figure out how many lines there are in all of the .c or .h files that are in here and get a total count at the very end. So if we run that, there's 718,000 lines, roughly, of code, which, I don't know, there's more stuff to deal with in Linux, is the thing. OpenBSD does not have a UDEV. That whole situation is not a thing. So all this UDEV stuff, systemd kind of needs to deal with, probably. Oh, you don't have to just worry about that on OpenBSD because OpenBSD's dev file is just a massive directory with all the devices that you could probably ever possibly need. You can add more if you need to. Super simple. But probably all the devices you could ever need and they don't dynamically allocate them and take them in and out of that dev directory. So, but there's still, that's a lot of code. You know, the entire OpenBSD kernel, I think, is two and a half million lines. So, three and a half times bigger than just this startup script. And that's drivers and everything. That's not just the core core code. That's all the drivers. So 
stuff that you're never going to use on your computer is included in that count. Whether or not that's a good or bad thing is something that I think is debatable in and of itself. I do think that there is something to be said against software bloat. You can't have a bug in code that you that hasn't been written. At the same time, software should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And for me, I don't miss anything about System D. There's never have I been using init RC init, OpenBSD's version of init, and thought, you know, I could really use some more functionality here. <clears throat> there's one there's one area where I thought that I would need some functionality that wasn't there. And that's on my Raspberry Pi, I actually have multiple encrypted hard drives. Or, I mean, they're, one of them's an SD card and one's a USB drive. <clears throat> and they're both encrypted. And they're separate physical drives. And because they're separate physical drives, you need to enter the password for both of them before you can access them. The system can't access them until you've entered the password for them. And OpenBSD will prompt you for the password for your root file system at boot if that root file system is encrypted, but it won't do it for others. But because, and I thought that this was a big problem, because the RC, I thought, well, the RC script doesn't ask you for this. And there should be an option to say, hey, I need you to ask me for the passwords for all of these things. But because you have to be present at boot, or present to get the drives, Having to enter an extra command or two to do that should not be considered a fault in the code. And that's essentially what you have to do. You enter the password for the root drive, and then you boot single user. And when you're booting single user, you just get put into a shell, and then a root shell, and from that root shell, you run the one command you need to give the system access to the second encrypted, non-root encrypted drive. And you can do that for whatever drives you, however many drives you had, you know, encryption on, you can do that for all of them. And then if you want to, you can run file system checks because those will get skipped when you exit the single user shell. And <clears throat> there's not documentation on how to do that, but because the shell scripts are so short, I, not a professional developer, just somebody who really likes computers and has a degree in a technical but unrelated field. Well, not unrelated. Math isn't unrelated to computer science, but it's not computer science. <laughs> It's maybe theoretical computer science and math, but, you know. Anyway, I can just read the whole startup script and figure out that I need to do that because it's so short. And I like having that capability. I've tried reading systemd source code, and it's not easy. So... You know, it's not going to be easy to read, you know, a thousand lines of code, especially if you're not used to that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I don't love the documentation for systemd. I love the documentation on OpenBSD for everything, but especially for, especially for the RC scripts, you know. 
And that brings me to the last thing that I want to say, which is that there is actually a manual page for that, the script file that we're looking at right now. And in having a manual page for a program is really nice because it gives you an idea of what is this program supposed to be doing. And when you know what a program is supposed to be doing, it's easier to read the source code. And I know there are some developers who actually will write the documentation for a program before they start programming. Uh, it's a particular model of development. So, <clears throat> you know, if you're feeling curious about the various options that you might need uh, if you're going to write an RC script, then <clears throat> should read this manual page. I need to know it because I'm planning on, oh, I've already written a server that I want to put into the OpenBSD package system. And <clears throat> I need to do a little bit of debugging and write some RC scripts and do some stuff like that. So, yeah, that's something worth knowing if you're into that kind of thing. So, <clears throat> anyway, that's it for this video. Hit like if you like this video. Hit dislike if you didn't like it. In either case, leave a comment down below letting me know why. You can do this now, too, which is cool. Point down below. That's where the comments are. They're down there. <laughs> and, yeah, if you got any questions, criticisms, or concerns, let me know about that as well. And uh, as always, if you want to get notified when I make new videos, hit subscribe. Thanks. Peace.